um, it happens every now and then, and it feels really good when you do because, Ooh. I mean, that's just a, a grand slam when you're representing a buyer who's a little bit tighter on cash, don't want to dive into their pillow, need to maybe save money for cosmetic or structural repairs that they couldn't mm-hmm. negotiate during the process. So it, okay. uh, it feels good when you make those happen. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and this is The Closing Table, where we talk to experts about their experience in real estate all across the country. Let's go. Welcome to the closing table. Come on, pull up a seat. Welcome. My name is Kevin McIntosh. Joining us here on this very special episode, we will be speaking with the top producing agent, Brock Love. How you doing, Brock? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for having me. Man, super duper fantastic name that you have, by the way. I, I love that Appreciate name. It. <laughs> Just Appreciate when I thought it. my name was cool. <laughs> so, Brock, hey, man, uh, we're here for a reason. We're going to talk about your experience and insights in real estate, obviously. But before we even dig into that, I have a quick little game for you. It's called fill in the blank. Got three sentences, man. They they need they need to be completed, but there's a blank in there. You fill it in with whatever information, context, or or whatever you feel like will be appropriate to complete that sentence. Sound good? Sounds good. A little right, nervous on my task. My task. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You'll do great. All right, first one. My real estate market is mostly affected by blank. Demand. Mm. Good one. Or okay. inventory, however you want to phrase that. Okay, okay. Most new home buyers, common mistake is blank. Thinking that no money down means no money at the closing table. Mm, I'm glad you brought that up. We will get into that later. Lastly, blank can help you sell a home faster. Media. the Like all the promotional materials, photography, videography. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I wasn't expecting that answer. Great. Great way to start off the show, Brock. I appreciate you for being here. All right. And before we really dig into the ins and outs of everything, I want to start things out with you just describing your current market that you service. Describe it for anyone who's never been there in as much detail as possible, starting with uh, geographically. Okay. We're in the low country, uh, right off set of Tybee Island. So Savannah, Georgia, one of the Mm -hmm. first planned cities in America. And really really warm we got very very mild winters so we get a lot of snowbirds um that's what happens when you're like tucked away right above florida so <laughs> right <laughs> that, that would be the geographical standpoint okay okay what about uh things to do notable landmarks and things of that nature going on in savannah or in your area i should say understood well for notable landmarks um because we were one of the first planned cities in america Mm-hmm. All of Savannah Historic District is pretty concentrated. There's a lot of squares. Um, if you ever looked at a map, you know, you got Chippewa and you got Whitaker, you got just tons of little city squares. But also that means mm-hmm. we got a lot of um, old homes that have stayed up to date, renovated, like nice little landmarks. You got the St. John's Cathedral, River Street, of course. And the things that do are pretty like intertwined with that is because our historic district is set up the way it is. We're also one of like, 10 cities in America where you can walk around and drink. And that is obviously a very wow. strong pull to Savannah's. You know, if you can just kind of be in one bar, grab a drink, go somewhere else. It makes St. Patrick's Day a huge hit here. Mm. Um, but there's still a lot of things to do that just aren't related to drinking. You know, there's a big thing with the tourists. There's a, we got a lot of haunted, haunted tours. I've still yet to be on one. We got a lot of historic <laughs> sites like Bonaventure yeah. Cemetery. You got Fort oh. Pulaski right up the road. Mm. You're only, if you're in Savannah, you're only 25, 30 minutes from the beach without traffic. So huge asterisk there because it's only one bridge to get to Tybee. Um, we got a, quite a lot to do. My favorite thing, of course, um, I'm a big foodie. Uh, so okay. we love to go out to different restaurants in Savannah is, I mean, has no shortage of options. Nice, nice. Thank you for painting that picture for. I just learned a little, a few new things about your about the Savannah, Georgia area. It is beautiful. I, I highly recommend everybody come visit at least. Right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Make sure you make your way out there to Savannah, Georgia. See what's going on out there. Uh, Brock, we are gathered here today um, 
for me to pick your brain. Yes, sir. So we 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 really want to lay out some information for potential home buyers and sellers and things of that nature, right? While doing some research on just buying a home in general, right? I started to see some things that explained or or talk about seller concessions. Now, I have no idea exactly what a seller concession is. When I'm just thinking of that phrase, I'm thinking the seller is giving somebody something. Can we talk about what a seller concession is and how does it benefit or how does a buyer benefit from them? Okay, so seller concessions are a little bit, um, I'm not going to say new to the picture. They've always been around, but mm. as this market has cooled off some, we got out of the crazy interest rate because that was that was the big thing about the past like two years is there were no seller concessions. Um it was mm. a seller's market through and through. And now we're seeing at least somewhat of that cooling off to where originally it could be anything like just splitting the closing costs, you know, half and half in the attorney fees, the mortgage origination, you know, prepaids. Um, but now we went through a huge, huge slump. You know, as everybody knows, the interest rate spiked huge between September and December and real estate just kind of came to a halt. You know, you got right, the holidays right. compounded on that and the seller concessions then began you know, we had sellers offering $10,000 for interest buy down, you know, so that people would save money on their monthly payment, pay off principal faster. Um, oh. You have carpet stipends, roof stipends. Um, there's a lot of ways that sellers are able to contribute mm. to the home sale because for them, most people are selling or refinancing within seven years. So they have plenty of equity and which means it's a good cash day at the closing table for them. Um, whereas mm. buyers usually come in, they have to come out of pocket to get in the home. And since it's cash, you can use that cash as a leverage during negotiations that they can just kind of pay everything off at closing that they need to, to get the home sold. Like I said, it was so, it was so demanding last year. We didn't see a lot of it until the fall. Right. Ah, uh, so, so this ultimately sounds like one of those things that a seller will offer to entice a buyer to want to purchase the home. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Their, their goal, um, whether it's relocation or just cashing out and upscaling, is to sell their home. Um, if there was to be a slump or if they're not getting the traction they want at the price that they have it listed as, they'll start offering seller concessions. Wow. Um, and now sometimes it's not offered outright. You just, you know, you talk to the agent, you talk with your buyers. Every situation is different, but, you know, it could be as simple as doing a full price offer, but then asking for $8,000 in contributions to closing. Mm. You see the closing costs, you know, you can roll that into interest buy down the way the Georgia contracts work. It's just a blank seller's contribution at closing. And so it's, we have a lot of flexibility with what we can do with that. Wow. Okay. Okay. I mean, that kind of answers my, the, the follow up question that I was going to ask, why would a seller even offer those? It, it just seems like there's no benefit to them, but the benefit is, I guess, them just basically in, enticing the deal a little bit more right incentivizing it so that the buyer you know wants to actually purpose uh, purchase it but like you said with the market as of recently being pretty much a seller's market like they don't really need that leverage i mean they haven't as it as of recently at least do you see those becoming more popular or coming into play a little bit more during contracts and deals in the future the spring and summer or do you see the demand just still heating up and seller concessions not even existing for this season that's a good question, um, mostly because I don't have a crystal ball. So like what's coming, it's hard to know, but it does. You know, there is optimism, especially mm -hmm. third and fourth quarter. So I, when I say optimism, I mean optimism on the interest rate side. But right, right, when right. it's a good time to buy interest rate wise, it's a very hard time to buy because of the competition. Yes. That's when those sellers concessions are going to start reeling back. Um, the biggest thing that I've noticed about seller concessions is you got to the top end these like, I would say, for me, upper scale properties, but midline properties, when you're like looking in the 400s and so that's when people are, you know, people are a little bit more picky, which they have every right to be because that is a large sum of money. So mm -hmm. sellers, you know, are more willing to pay to get, you know, carpet renewal, fresh paint, roof replacement. It's when you get mm -hmm. down into the sub 200 or 220,000 and below that the demand is really, really hot there. Like there is a ton of people in need um, without the same amount of capital as uh, the people at the 400,000, 500,000 shopping range. Mm, but that being okay. said, that's that's also your buyers that typically 
you know, they may have a down payment, but it'll be a little bit harder to get to the closing table. So we always try to negotiate as much as we can. That's really where the seller concessions are. Like, I'm not going to say a must, um, but they matter. They matter a ton. So that's kind of our job is to go to bat for our buyers, sell the uh, listing agent, the sellers on our clients, even if, mm-hmm. you know, it means that the seller is going to get 4000 less or we negotiate for them to send 4000 cash to our side during closing. Mm, wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, a seller concession game is is super interesting. I would love to see how it, it plays out in the future as the market kind of kind of changes a little bit or just I should say. Let's keep let's keep this conversation this perspective going, right? I'm your client in a way, right? Let's let's keep yes, it sir. like that. All so, right. I apply uh for a no money down program. Does this mean that I don't pay anything at closing? What is no money down? What does that assistance really mean? Okay, so no money down, your down payment, that is strictly between you as the client and your lender, the bank, whoever's giving you the, the mortgage. Okay. Whereas to make that transaction happen for the conveyance of property, there's still other parties involved. Um, mm-hmm. You have attorneys, the lender themselves are going to charge an origination. Uh, mm-hmm. You have appraisers, home inspectors. So all of those are still costs that it would take to get to the closing table. Right. But that's where, you know, everything is negotiable. A lot of times we can get people some help. It's a limited, um, depends on the property, location, demand for that property. It's kind of weird because we have such a huge demand right now in Savannah because we have so many rental properties. We don't have a lot of new construction for resale and we're growing. Um, mm. NAR has us as like the sixth fastest growing state um, this year or this past year. And uh, it's creating like a choke point. But then at the same time, you know, the majority of people that are trying to buy a $210,000 home need a little bit of help at the closing table. So right, right. you still have those costs you always have to keep in mind, even if you are on a 100% financing program. Uh, now, so, so always no communicate that to your agent. Yes, because right. no money down is just for the mortgage. You know, you have your you have your oh. loan to value, but then you have those closing costs. Oh, the crap. attorney's so, got to get paid. The bank wants on, to get bro. paid. <laughs> I yeah. thought I, I thought no money down. I don't have to put the money here, man. I, gotta I put wish some money. <laughs> I wish that were true. I mean, that being said, every now and then you get to go to bat for a buyer. Um, they're on a USDA rural advocacy program. Right. They're not right. paying a down payment and you get their closing costs covered. Um, it happens every now and then. And it feels really good when you do, because Ooh. I mean, that's just a, a grand slam when you're representing a buyer who's a little bit tighter on cash, don't want to dive into their pillow, need to maybe save money for cosmetic or structural repairs that they couldn't mm-hmm. negotiate during the process. So it okay. uh, it feels good when you make those happen. So that kind of brought me to two different questions in a way, right? First one, if I do apply and get approved for a no money down program, that obviously means I'm getting assistance from someone who's actually coming with some cash to help me pay with that, that down payment. Does that down payment assistant money go towards the equity that I would have in that home? So when it's a hundred percent financing, no, you are financing the entire value of the home. Now, if you were going through a down payment assistance program, like Georgia dream, Mm. typically the way that works is there is a down payment assistance. that's going to help help you get to the closing table, but it acts as a second mortgage with no monthly payments due until you refinance or sell, or if you've um, lived in the home long enough that it gets dropped off, but it's basically a second mortgage that's sitting out there floating for the day that you do sell your home, the bank then wants to be compensated back. Wow. Okay. Yes. Okay. So how long was, you said that's the Georgia dream. How long has that been going on? Is that a new initiative? I don't think it's newer. It's just we haven't seen it. Um, they come with a little bit of their own obstacles. The hmm. you know standard close is probably about 30 days with Georgia Dream. You're looking closer to 60. It's very income limited. Like um, you, We have USDA, which is rural, and that's right. 100% financing. So mm-hmm. there is no second mortgage out there that already has income limits. And then Georgia Dream is one step above that, where they do give you your down payment, but it is... There's even more hoops and ladders you got to jump through. Um, house has to be obviously in a certain condition. So it's a little bit more restrictive. And when these sellers can have a cash buyer or a 10% conventional seller, they typically decide that way. So as this market cools mm. off, if it continues to cool off, you know, we could see that coming back in droves. Right. Um, obviously, it's a great program, but 
you know, we're already spoiled. If you're not buying small asterisk, but if you're not buying in the Savannah city limits, just about every property in our area, like our MLS can go with a USDA. Hmm. That's interesting for a program. That's hundred percent financing too. That's pretty yes. nice. All right, Brock. So with that being said, the Georgia dream, or let's, let's step away from the Georgia. You know, let's, let's talk about that. So I, I don't know if you talked about what are, what, what are the, what is the criteria? to 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 qualify for that i know you said it's basically financial based do you know any more details as to how to qualify for it so typically i allow like um my lenders that i handpick specialize in the numbers to deliver that info to the uh clients mm -hmm. i know ballpark you can't have more than twenty thousand dollars like in your bank account or in some kind of assets really um, <laughs> yeah yeah that's i mean crazy. but you gotta think you know that's that program not everybody can qualify for it and it's not an endless amount of money. So they have to vet who does right, qualify. Right, right. I get it. Um, you know, you don't want somebody that's got a $70,000 IRA out there, <laughs> you know, that they can pull from getting right. this and another family <laughs> loses out. Um, yeah, yeah, I think right. the same thing with USDA, that being said, in my experience, I've never heard of the USDA fund running out, but there is only a certain amount. That's why they're uh, like, they have underwriting and then it actually goes to the rural department to get approved. They have mm -hmm. a certain amount that they can lend out. Um, well, hopefully that number grows because like I said, we're still, we're anticipating a ton of growth in this area over the next few years. And I'm, I'm sure that that program will still be popular. Mm. And just for clarification purposes, Brock, what is a USDA loan? What is USDA that? United States? Uh, man, I just know what it's called. Uh, development. <laughs> Let me, can I cheat? Can I use Google real quick? No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. United States Department of Agricultural Rural Development. Mm, there so, it is. There it bringing is. Bringing growth to, like I said, it's outside of the Savannah city limits because that is a metro area. Mm -hmm. um, I think a little bit of Richmond Hill in our area is uh, disqualified from USDA. Mm. But like where I live out in Effingham, which is 20 minutes away, or if you were in Brooklyn, Ella Bell, any of our little satellite cities, um, more than more than likely you're going to be able to do USDA as long as you're not making a certain amount of money too. That one has income protection too. I think it's right. $96,000 household income. Mm. So it okay. gets pretty strict as well. Okay. Okay. And that USDA, uh, just to even be more specific, is pretty much applies for people who's looking for properties in the rural areas, the country areas and things of that nature. So, so appreciate that. yes, typically. Um, the funny thing is like, a lot of our satellite cities are grown up and commercial and still get that RD um, mm. tag. Like, you know, if you drive through Pooler, Georgia, now it's nothing but um, shopping centers and food and restaurants and highways. And yet you can get a USDA in a lot of the Pooler area. Oh, that's good. That's good information. Yeah. No, do you think that's probably because maybe it, it, it has developed more since it was established as a place that does receive USDA or... Absolutely. Just, yeah. Well, I, oh, I grew up okay. in Pooler and it was, it was not much. I mean, okay. there one you little go. highway 80 strip and now it's, it's huge. It's grown up a ton. Um, Savannah's kind of at capacity, so it's bleeding out, but those areas are still allowed to go USDA. I, I don't want to spend too much more time on this. Just the last question with that. So if with that being said, do you think that that privilege or that program could be taken away with that town being more developed now than what it was before? Well, a certain part of Pooler already has been, um, they basically like rezoned what was uh, mm. Pooler and what was Savannah through the zip codes because I think all that rapid growth, the fire departments and a couple of other issues were keeping it to where they couldn't get service properly. So it got zoned to Savannah and it took out a lot of the, a lot of the little neighborhoods in the area, just like on right, that right. parkway stretch. So, yeah, I absolutely do believe that as that as we get an influx and as we get growth, there will be areas to get zoned where they do not qualify for the rural development program. Oh, oh good to know. Good to know. Thank you for that knowledge, Brock. So uh, you say you understand the importance of strengthening the local community, right? We're basically finding and supporting local business. Can you talk more about your emphasis in finding and supporting local business in the community? And how do you incorporate this into your work as a real estate agent? Absolutely. Um, it might take me a second to wade through it and gather my thoughts, but obviously this has been my home for, I lived in Memphis for one year, but outside of that, my whole life, I've been in 
the Savannah, Georgia area. I'm very proud right. of where we're from. I, I love my city. Um, and one of the best things that makes it is the, the hospitality, the fact that, you know, we are just one big community. And so as I've gotten older, there's just been a huge appreciation for friends starting businesses, whether it's in construction or restaurants, mm. T-shirts, podcasts, um, that we just take a lot of pride in being able to support people. I think a lot of it comes from the fact that I'm not a creative person. Um, I don't, you know, I'm just kind of very math brain, very analytical. So I see somebody that whether it's a unique approach to uh, how to start a restaurant, like uh, we have a little coffee shop, Venezuelan coffee shop in Trupio. I still tell people it's heaven on earth. It's the best small business that we've had in Savannah in my entire life. And it's maybe only two years old and it's incredible um, stuff mm. like that. Or, you know, obviously when friends get into photography, we want to try and always track out as much business to that. It's just, I think it's just super important because, right. you know, corporations. We grew up during the nineties. I would imagine me and you seem about the same age and we grew up, you know, everybody knew the Walmart rollback theme song and everybody wanted a Walmart <laughs> in their backyard. And now we're all kind of, we're burnt out on that. We're burnt out on seeing all the Amazon packages. It's cool to see this growth of small businesses coming back. That um, is good. I would definitely love to see more of it. That is good, man. Yeah. Community for real, for real supporting local businesses. That's what it's about. Keep that dollar flowing in that economy, man. Absolutely. So I, got, I, got to, I, I got to show you some uh, appreciation, man. You were awarded this, the Silver Award, and you were named Rookie of the Year by your brokerage, man. Congratulations, first Thank and you. foremost, Thank man. Thank you. I appreciate now, that. Now, let's talk more about it. Can you tell us more about the criteria that we use to evaluate your work and what set you apart from other agents in your industry? Okay. Um, Silver Award is um, was actually pretty modest. It's two millions in sales. Um, when I first got my real estate license last year, um, I still work a full-time job designing power transformers. So my goal from the outgoing was just to sell $1 million of real estate. If I could do that without, you know, doing promotion, buying leads, I would have been pretty proud of that. Um, then 1 million, the goal quickly became 2 million. That's mm -hmm. what it took to earn the silver award. And then the next bracket was 5 million. I actually did not make it to 5 million. Um, which is funny cause I got goal from 1 million to 2 million to 3 million to 4 million that I ended up being disappointed with how I performed last year, despite winning rookie of the year, despite winning the silver award, mm -hmm. even though I almost quadrupled my original goal. So I ended up with about 3.7 in sales in our area, which I was pretty happy with. And then rookie of the year. I don't know how I got lucky enough to win that. I mean, obviously, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of made a little bit of a splash, I'd say with like my number of transactions and the volume, um, quadruple my original goal but to me i didn't feel like i deserved it uh right you know we're all our biggest critics so the fact that i didn't get to five million the fact that there was sales i lost um you know like people that just kind of got burned out with not being able to buy a home sometimes they withdrew mm -hmm. yeah. stuff like that you know it weighs heavy on you so it's always knowing um at one point i, I wasn't confident in how much i could perform all at once given that I had a full-time job. So I, I had referred uh, two clients to some coworkers of mine. And had I not done that, that would have, uh, I would have hit my 4 million goal. I would have helped mm. those families, made an impact. Um, yep. There were feel good sales. I still ran into them after closing just to talk to them, congratulate them. But that one kind of, that one kind of hurt. And as far as setting myself apart, um, I mean, we're, we're really lucky to have just, ton of amazing realtors in this area and uh so it's hard to say you know what sets me apart especially because i'm still pretty new to it i'm still trying to learn so i'll sit there and you know kill myself in comparison because i want to compare myself to an agent doing it eight nine years and uh so i really don't i don't know um i mean the biggest thing is i just try to try to carry myself always with the the same integrity that i would think everybody else would appreciate um there it is full honesty and transparency I don't want buyers, especially, you know, when you're representing buyers, I want to make sure that they're always completely informed about what they're doing, because for them, this is about to be the biggest expense of their life. So I, mm -hmm. you know, the, my biggest fear and the way I carry myself is just, I don't want after the sale or the day of the sale, the day of closing for there to be the question of, oh, well, I didn't know this. What is this? Ooh. You didn't tell me this. That's the big one. Ooh, I always, yeah. you know, if I got a call within two months, oh, you didn't tell me X, Y, you know, I'm going to hate I myself for that. So that's what I try to try yeah. to avoid. If I can just be as transparent, obviously ethical, I'm not going to 
do or say, but that's a lot of us. We took the code of ethics for a reason. We're not going to mm-hmm. say or do anything to entice a sale. It's just, you know, listening as tentatively as I can <clears throat> to my clients and just fulfilling their needs. Um, getting on with a game plan. I usually work with clients, um, like for buyers, it's always, Hey, this is how much they want their monthly payment to be. So this is kind of the property we need to shop for. And these are the closing table expenses we got to keep in mind and navigate myself that way with sellers. They usually have, Hey, we'd like to make this much out of it. And then we just Mm -hmm. base the marketing, the initial pricing, as long as it's reasonable, you know, we have to, the, the houses do have to appraise. So we have to comp them, right. Market them as strongly as we can. And then just, um, tackle everything we can as strong through the, the negotiations phase to make sure that my sellers end up being happy, my buyers yeah, end up is. being happy. And at the end of the day, people are getting homes because that's ultimately what it is about. It is about getting families in and out of the homes. Facts, facts, facts. One thing that you said that stood out was the fact that you say, you know, being different is really just, you know, you working with int- integrity. Now, something, a statement like that may seem just so small and irrelevant, but that's just, that's very, it's a very profound statement because something like that can set you apart from other people. Other people's integrity is different. You see Absolutely. what I'm saying? So, so with you having your definition of integrity and walking in purpose with that and keeping that in your career, absolutely that will set you apart, in my opinion. Also, another thing that I want to challenge you on, you said you didn't think you considered yourself a creative person. I like to say everybody's <laughs> creative. If you are in some type of problem whatsoever, if you ever find a solution, I feel like the majority of the times you're using your creativity. You may not count it as creativity. Even in a traffic jam, if you find a different way to get to your destination, you're kind of using creativity. So I that's, just wanted to give you some true, credit there, bro. Yeah, just wanted well, to give you some credit that. there, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your hobbies outside of working as a full-time real estate agent, particularly fostering dogs for rescue agencies, such a kind hearted thing to do, man. Have you, have you found any ways to incorporate your love for animals into your work as a real estate agent? Like, like finding a home that'll be appropriate for people who has a dog, pet friendly homes and things. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely, you get clients all the time where they're, they're looking for, Oh, I want, you know, yard space for my dogs. Um, typically yep. what I would tell them then is, you know, if you're looking out in unincorporated Effingham, when you're off city water, you're going to be on a septic tank. A septic tank means usually a minimum of half an acre, which means your animals are going to get plenty of room. Um, yeah. That was actually what shaped our home buying decision too. Uh, really? Then of course, you know, we are able to help with the uh, rentals. That being said, we're in a huge chokehold with rentals too. We just have, we're, we're growing up a little bit too fast. And so, the thing that crushes me the most is when you find six, seven eligible properties for somebody and every single one of them or all but one of them are pet restrictive. Uh, mm. It is a seller's property. So obviously we got to be understanding that not everybody wants to take that risk, but it is a, uh, that's part where it sucks being an animal lover. Um, right. Especially when people start talking about like want to rehome the dogs because of it, that, uh, that hurts. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we are lucky to have several, really good pet rescue um, companies in the area. You know, like right now we're currently fostering for Renegade. This is uh, our second full foster with Renegade. We've done a couple sleepovers, a um, couple like transport holds. Our pit bull is from One Love Animal Rescue in the area. We've done some okay. fostering for them, some transport holds for them as well. Um, they're both great. And then my best friend who is a co-worker with me at Georgia Transformer. I've known her since 2012. She actually just started her own animal rescue. It's the Guardians of Effingham Animal Rescue right here. Nice. In nice. Effingham, which is just outside of Savannah. And she's building it from the ground up. Um, I think she has 14 dogs. A lot of them are oh, fosters. Oh, man. Yeah, she, uh, yeah she's <laughs> so committed to the cause. It's, it's awesome to see it. There it is. There it is. That's nice to hear, man. Glad you... Glad, I think you might be the first realtor I've had on the show who, you know, not only is a, a hardcore dog lover and, and animal lover, but you also really put that work into uh put or put that love into your work, man. And, and consider that when you are dealing with clients, we have pets also, man. I think that's a very honorable thing, man. Thank you. Thank you. Brock, uh, you, you like to read novels in your spare time also. I found that out about you, sir. So yes, I need sir. you to give us give us a good book, a, a good book that you read, whether it's recent or not. Just give us a book that you read that may have changed or shaped how you kind of perform in your career. The book I read 
um, or I recommend the most to everybody is a uh, East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Um, mm. Most people know him from like of mice and men and grapes of wrath, but East of Eden is, uh, oh, yeah. it is incredible. Uh, okay. When you talk about just being, trying to carry on with a simple life, uh, you know, just sticking to just your honesty, integrity, those virtues. Uh, that's what East of Eden is about. It's about a man's struggle as he's like leading through his generation of families, you know, first his parents and then his kids. Mm -hmm. Just trying to find out what makes a person being a good person. Um, super, super strong book. Absolutely love it. Uh, got a friend of mine that finally got into reading after 20 something years. I mean, we were in AP literature together and he would never read a book. I finally got him to sit down and read it. <laughs> You know, it's, it's one of those, like, I mean, it just, it's a historical book for a reason. It's a classic. So mm, yeah. East, East of Eden, John Steinbeck, highly recommend. I'm going to have to put that on my list, man. Thank you for that book recommendation. I got a curveball for you, Brock. Is it considered yes. reading if you listen to it on the audio book? Oh, <laughs> I have a pretty <laughs> strong feeling about this. Um, I don't get to read as much as I used to because it's still a, <laughs> two jobs so it's definitely something that fell by the wayside but um right right i used to argue with my friends that no it does not <laughs> count um that's somebody reading to you there's something so great about like yeah. the tangential like sensation of reading a book like the tactile Facts. the pages the smell yep. just agree. the sound the way but when i moved to memphis we would we would come back pretty much once a month that's a nine and a half hour drive and i did get into audio booking and yeah. it is a little bit harder for me because I'm a visual learner. Mm -hmm. um, audio is a little bit harder. Like I was never good. I could read French, but I couldn't speak right. it or hear it in class. Um, I'm just a visual person. So it's still, to me, not my preferred way to read. And then Kindles are, I would say Kindles do count um, just because the convenience. I can see that. I feel like yeah, I can yeah. read a lot more now, but it never will stand up to just like sitting out like in a hammock or just out in the park. Old fashioned um, hard cover. Yeah, yeah man. absolutely. Yeah. Man, Forsyth Park in Savannah, that's like one of the best places to go to just sit outside, enjoy some coffee and read for the day. There it is, man. There it is. So sorry about that last curveball. Just since you brought no, it up, good. I had to ask anyway, Brock. Well, thank you for coming to the closing table, man, and dropping some gems for our audience, man. We appreciate that. Before we go, if you have any last words and or want to tell the people how to reach out to you, you can do so now. Okay, absolutely. Um. Uh, reaching out to me, I'm, I make myself super, super available to all my clients. I don't really have a, a time limit when I turn my brain off uh, for work. So, you know, obviously by phone, anytime. Um, but if, you know, most conveniently by email, um, and that's brocklove1993 at gmail.com. That just allows me to work with you on like when I can first coordinate the first time. Mm -hmm. I like to set aside a nice a bit of time for like that introductory talk because, you know, if it's the three minutes in between house showings, it's not going to be a great, a great way to get get started. So I try to set up like one little phone call to really get moving. Um, that being said, I would definitely love for people to reach out through email because so far my contracts have been mostly organic. People I know, people I already have rapport with. So one of the nice. exciting things about real estate is being able to help strangers too. So. All right, there it is. Thank you for coming by the uh, closing table, Brock. We appreciate you for giving us some knowledge. For our YouTube audience watching right now, you have a job too. Hit that like button for us, please, and thank you. If you got this far in the video also, we need you to share this video, and we need you to subscribe to our channel, okay? Then if you're listening on audio platform, Audible, Spotify, Apple, Spotify, any other podcast platforms. There we go. We need you to do the same. Give us a like, a five-star rating, and also subscribe for our latest content. Brock, I'd like to leave our audience with a question before we get up out of here. Hey, audience, what would help you trust a real estate agent who just started their career within a year? Drop your comments below. Other than that, we'll see you next time.